This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. The Nigel Farage Show. Good morning, everybody. This is the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. And we, like all the other programmes on a Sunday morning, will be talking to some of the leading commentators and politicians involved in the week's news and the week's to come's news. But, of course, crucially, the difference here on LBC is you get to have your say. And uh, I think that's pretty important because I don't know about you, but I thought... Mrs May, and let's remember, earlier this year, the Lancaster House speech, Brexit means Brexit, we were told. A general election, vote for me, I'm the woman that is going to give you Brexit. And then she goes to Florence, drags the British press corps down there to tell them, well, actually, we're sort of going to leave in 2019, but we're not really going to leave. Actually, we're going to stay in virtually everything for the course of the next two years. Um, oh, and by the way, the European Union is fantastic. It's wonderful. Nearly everything it does, it does really, really well. Uh, and long term, uh, we're going to be committed to staying part of nearly all of it, albeit we will rebadge each different organisation. Uh, and I watched all of this and thought to myself... What on earth is going on? And why am I seeing all these cabinet ministers, the Borises, the Goves and people like that, all rallying round for the good of the party when it's pretty clear to me that the voters have been shortchanged? In fact, I felt her speech literally stuck two fingers up to the Brexit voters. Because remember, from a date of Brexit, it was nine months to trigger Article 50. Then the voters were told, oh, no, 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 you're not going to get Brexit yet. There's a two-year process now we have to go through. It's called Article 50, but don't worry, little heads. At the end of that, we'll be out. And now we're told, well, actually, we won't be leaving in, 20, in 2019. It'll be 2021. Or will it be 2021? Because this transition period, which she herself rebranded as the implementation period, she said would be around about two years. Well, kind of around about two years takes us, does it not, to the next general election. I would have thought there's very little hope of us being out properly by the time the next election comes along. Uh, and that's the Conservative Party. And we're beginning to hear um, a few backbenchers who are showing some sign of resentment. And just before the show, I spoke to Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Conservative MP for North East Somerset, and I started by asking him whether Brexiteers will be upset with Mrs May's speech. I think it would be upset if we were still under the auspices of the European Court beyond March 2019. I think the legal point is absolutely essential. But if our law is still subsidiary to European law, we have not left, and that would undermine the vote that we had uh, in June of last year. The other issues are important, but at least they're then under our control, and it's our voluntary will as a sovereign nation uh, to extend free movement. Well, it's, a, well, it, well, it's our I will as a choose, government, I wouldn't isn't choose it? to do... Yeah, I wouldn't choose to do that. I think that actually tells you more about the incompetence of the Home Office than anything else. So let's just be clear then, what Mrs May has said to us. Free movement continues until at least 2021. Uh, effectively. Uh, not in yeah. a strict legal sense, but effectively. OK, and we go on paying eight to ten billion pounds a year net. Uh, indeed, we continue with our current level of contributions. Uh, all EU laws that exist at the moment continue. Uh, yes, they come under UK law under the repeal bill, the, and we would then continue to impose any that affected the single market for the following two okay. years. So I'm a, I'm a kind of voter, Jacob. I've never voted in my life, but I was motivated on the 23rd of June to go and vote because I was told this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to change the future course of my country. And let's say I voted Brexit. And then I waited nine months for Article 50 to be triggered, to be told it'll all be OK because we have, we have a two-year period where we're going to sort everything out. It's called Article 50. And now I'm told that we have another two years on top of that, at least. I mean, haven't I a right to feel pretty upset when Mrs May stood at the election telling me Brexit means Brexit and now it's been kicked into the long grass for who knows how long? I don't fully endorse what you're saying. I have my concerns, make no bones about that. Um, 
but I do think the legal point is crucial, that once we are out of the legal supremacy of the European Union, we can then change our laws. Parliament can change laws and nobody can overrule us. So in that two-year implementation period, that becomes the will of a sovereign people, uh, a democratic people, to decide what they want to do. It's no longer um, something that is enforced upon us by a foreign organisation. No. But the problem is... The political class, we've seen the Labour Party go from a general election from saying end free movement, leave the single market to taking the contrary position. And we've now seen the Conservative Party decide that everything will be delayed for at least two years. Now, well, doesn't, doesn't that take us up to the next general election? So isn't it realistic to say that the next general election will be fought by a Conservative Party saying, <coughs> saying trust us, we will get you out? Um, no, I, I, I think there is a risk that the Labour Party, if they got in, would try and undermine Brexit altogether. Their position is effectively that they want to stop Brexit. And but, Jacob, I mean, you're saying to me that Labour are slightly worse than the Conservatives. No, Labour are much worse, I much, see. much what, worse. What worse, um, than, because, what worse than Philip Hammond? Um, they're worse than the position of the government. But I, I do come back to this <laughs> legal point, because if we are out in March 2019, then... It's implementation rather than transition. Where I'd be really worried would be if we were still subject to the European Court, because then in no sense would we have left. And that means that it would be easy for somebody to continue this transition indefinitely. Um, whereas if we're no longer subject to the ECJ, then it's our laws, it's our <coughs> democratic institutions that determine our future. And two years to tidy things up to make things run more smoothly. It's is, not It's not going to happen in the space of those two years, is it? I don't think two years makes an awful lot of difference. I think we should be ready by the beginning of April 2019 to leave, and I think the bureaucracy of government should be getting a move on to ensure that our borders are ready, that the Home Office has things in place, that it can control the entry uh, of member state citizens um, from the EU, uh, that customs and excise can be ready to implement a border. But as I'm in favour of free trade, that shouldn't be too difficult. I, I think all that should be done by the beginning of April 2019. Isn't the truth, um, of, it, isn't the truth of it, Jacob, that your cabinet... Your party's cabinet is absolutely split down the middle, spends much of its time feuding against each other, either, either in private or in public, and doesn't ultimately, Mrs May, have to decide whether she wants to go with the Boris view of the world or the Hammond view of the world. Well, I think the Boris view of the world is a very good and positive one because it puts the argument as to why Brexit is very positive. The Remainers, the people who voted Remain, may accept that Brexit needs to happen, but they come at it from a point of view of this is a terrible decision uh, made by the electorate, and they're doing it reluctantly. Mm. Whereas Boris and people like him are saying this is the great opportunity for our future prosperity, and I think we need to hear much more of Boris, and the argument he put last week was really powerful and important. And do you think Mrs May survives and through to Christmas this year? I think Mrs May survives, yes, um, uh, and I think we need her to survive. I think we want um, a, a leader who is there through the negotiations, at least, uh, ideally longer, to make sure this actually happens. I, I think the greatest risk to Brexit would be a change in um, government. Well, a change in government, of course, would follow an election, but it doesn't mean the Conservative Party can't have a change of leader. And I notice... Well, technically, um, a change of government comes when the Prime Minister changes. Yes, but, I mean, we may well get we may well get a Prime Minister in the shape of Mrs May who doesn't want to do this forever. But your own, um, your own support base are cheered this morning, I see, that Mogmania has crossed the Atlantic and you are now being endorsed by the National Review in the United States of America. Um, how are the Reese Mogg leadership ambitions? They're non-existent. Uh, I want, <laughs> as you want, to get a proper Brexit and to um, contribute to conservative thinking uh, and, and to make sure that the country is as successful as it can be uh, on the basis of conservative principles. OK, and finally, Jacob, have the electorate been badly let down by the political class since the referendum? Not yet. If we don't leave the European Court of Justice jurisdiction, then yes, but that hasn't happened. Uh, but I assume we will be leaving that. Mm. And then Brexit is still 
not on as fast a track as you and I would like, but on a track that we ought to be able to live with. Well, I have to say uh, that Jacob was being spectacularly diplomatic when he said to me, I don't fully endorse your criticisms. He's clinging on to the hope that the European Court of Justice will not be supreme after the end of March 2019. But I have to say that's all pretty woolly and pretty vague. I'm asking you, do you think our political leaders are trying to stop Brexit or perhaps even worse, even betray us? Uh, and my view is yes, the Labour Party have completely changed their position since the general election. They now want to stay in the single market for at least the transition period, if not longer. And I don't believe this two-year implementation period, as Theresa May called it. They will fight the next general election with that still going on, telling us, trust us, we're the party that will take you out. I think the whole thing is really very, very poor indeed and i'm pretty angry about it let me know how you feel call me 0345 60 60 973 text to 84850 tweet using the hashtag farage and lbc at lbc watch us live on facebook and comment there too you're listening to the sunday edition of the nigel farage show here on lbc it's 10.15. So Mrs May drags the British press corps down to Florence in Italy for reasons that I still haven't yet been able to work out and tells them we're not really going to leave the European Union now in 2019. We're going to stay on for another couple of years. We're going to go on paying eight to ten billion pounds a year. We will have the free movement of people and the EU's laws will continue to apply to us. Oh, and by the way, we won't be negotiating trade deals with the 85% of the world economy that is not part of the European Union. Do you think our political leaders are trying to stop Brexit, or worse, even betray us? And before I go to your calls, a little bit of polling. Uh, the Mail on Sunday commissioned Servation in the wake of that speech uh, and asked people a variety of questions. Uh, the first was, um, is, I trust the Prime Minister to deliver a good deal for Brexit. Yes, say 34%, no, say 51%. Cabinet splits mean that Britain is less likely to get a good deal. Agree, 56%. Disagree, 12%. And here's the kicker. Was her speech a betrayal of Brexit? And this is published in today's Mail on Sunday. Field work done over the weekend by Servation. 38% say yes, it was a betrayal of Brexit. 26% say no. I think we're well on the way to being betrayed. I wonder what Matthew in Heathrow thinks of that. Good morning, Matthew. Morning, Nigel. Uh, basically, Nigel, we are leaving, but it's going to take time. So, ah, you know, right. OK. It's going to take time. I was positive with Theresa May. I mean, she's basically sort of... I mean, the negotiations are now about money, so we've had to make it clear to them during this transition arrangement or implementum period, we're going to have to carry on paying. And that's obviously... We've got to follow the same rules, so, but at least... It's going to take time. We're going to have to start controlling the immigration, what we can do now, and she's going to start doing that. It's going to take when? time to get all the... When? Well, she, I mean, she said she, she set the date in March 19, 2019, the day we... we oh, no, uh, Matthew. Free the... movement. Free movement continues after yeah. the end of March 2019. It's just that, in theory, people will have to register. Well, that's, yeah, that's how we're going to start to control it, by people registering, making so, sure they pay their taxes, we get entry entry checks, we know who's in the country, when they're in the country, are they working, or are they tourists? So we're going to trust, we're going to trust the worst Home Secretary in the history of this nation when it came to immigration to put in place a system. Matthew, regardless whether people are expected to register, free movement of people continues until at least 2021. That is five years after people voted Brexit. Am I not right to think that people should feel let down on that? Yeah, but we're, we're, we've been in the EU for 40 years. It's not going to happen overnight. The important thing is we've got to carry on that trade. And obviously the negotiations have hit a stumbling block. That we're, you know, we've got to get that free trade deal or to, to get a trade deal what's going to work. And it's going to put time to get that in place. Mm. So until And did you notice, Matthew, did you notice that... So we're going to stay part of the single market and the customs union with free movement. We're going to go on paying the 8 to 10 billion every year. So we continue as if we were still members of the union for that two years, albeit without any voting rights. What she didn't mention was the Brexit bill, because the Brexit bill's on top of that. So it looks like, it looks like the Brexit bill is probably going to be around about 40 billion sterling. Haven't people got a right to be upset about that? 
Well, that is still, if we, we can't just damage the economy. I mean, oh. you've got to see it to that. Basically, <laughs> we've got to carry on the trade we got. We're going to get more trade eventually in the rest of the world, but that's going to take time to get in place anyway. So we obviously there's going to be side talks going with the rest of the world, getting ready for those trade deals. Where we can Matthew, start new business. why would the rest of the world now take us seriously? Why would they even bother listening to us when they've been told that actually it will be a minimum of five years before we sign a trade deal with anybody from the time of Brexit? Why would anybody bother with us? Well, yeah, it's not going to happen yet. I mean, until we know what trading relationship we got in, in the UK, and it, it looks kind of like they're struggling to get that free trade deal. So, yeah, I mean, and if we don't get that free trade deal, we're going to we're going to lose so much business. We we've got to really get ourselves organised. All right, Matthew. To together. That's Matthew, your 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 confidence in the Prime Minister, your patience with the whole process is admirable in many ways can i ask you how long do you think the transition period will last well i, I think you know, what she said minimum two years it could be five years ah I mean, right it's, it's so that would then be seven takes. years after brexit before uh, well, fact, no eight years takes. after brexit until we left yeah, as long as it takes i mean we're slow no to be no no matthew out, we voted to slowly. leave well, we, yes, but that, that's going to damage... <laughs> no, 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 we had those arguments during the referendum. Yeah, but no, we're leaving. I mean, I wasn't going <laughs> to remain now, but we're leaving, but we've got to make sure we don't damage the Gosh, economy. Gosh, you know, and we... Matthew, I thank you. I thank you for the call. I wonder whether I'll live to see it if Theresa May stays as Prime Minister, but I really, really do. Russell says on Facebook, Nigel, May has timed this just right for the general election and Corbyn taking her seat and stopping Brexit. I have to say, Russell, she has timed this perfectly for the election, Mark my words, the transition period goes on to the general election, and then she says, trust us, we're the Conservative Party. Brexit will mean Brexit in the lifetime of the next Parliament. That is exactly what is going to happen here. Scotty says, what do you think Britain and Europe will look like by 2021, I dread to think? Darren says, total betrayal. Lost trust in the Tories, big time. Well, we'll talk a bit about Labour too um, on this show. They, of course, are meeting in Brighton. Um, and whilst they're not having a row over Brexit that is quite as seismic as that in the Conservative Party. They've still got their problems on this issue too. Penny from Chelsea, uh, has Mrs May reassured you that Brexit means Brexit? No, she hasn't, Nigel, and I'd like to thank you very much for everything you've done. I thought her speech was so boring and uninspiring, <laughs> and all she seemed to be doing was placating the EU members. Nothing for this country. I was really furious. Yes, she. You're Why quite right, Penny. Two she, years. She was really praiseworthy, wasn't she? She was. That's pr right. She was praiseworthy of the EU. I she was. Believe what I was hearing. No, she said it was wonderful in terms of security. Great in terms of trade. Yes. Its foreign aid budget was wonderful, and yes. we would stay part of all of it, just under a different label. And I still can't understand why she didn't trigger Article Fifty straight away. We wouldn't. We would have been more ahead now and we wouldn't have had all that trouble from Gina Miller. And could I ask you, Nigel, please, yes, would yes. you stand again? Ah, now, Penny, uh, this is a question that I'm being asked by an awful lot of people and, in fact, I think I've counted five newspaper articles this morning that suggest, as if they know, Farage to lead, break away from UKIP if one particular candidate wins. And I will, Penny, I will, I promise you, very shortly answer your question. Penny, I thank you very much for your call. And Penny's comment about how nice she was to all of the EU leaders. I love the piece uh, that Quentin Letts wrote in the Daily Mail on Saturday when he said, I thought at one point she might offer Jean-Claude Juncker a knighthood. <laughs> that was very much how it felt to me. Vincent is calling from Bedford. Vincent, good morning. One of the most uh, annoying parts of the where she said that this country would honour commitments to the European Union budget yeah. right up until even for two years afterwards so that no other member is left out of pocket or have to contribute more. But she did and say that. She, she absolutely said that, Vincent. You're right. And, and what, what got me thinking was why she doesn't show the same uh, generosity and consideration to... Um, 
for example, public, public services in this country. Well, the feeling was, Vincent, that she went to Florence to tell the EU what a fantastic organisation it was, what a great success it had been, how we loved the whole thing, how we were going to be very generous in every way we could be, and please, in return, could they give us some sort of trade deal. That's what it was all about. There are no guarantees, of course, uh, that what she said will get her anywhere. In fact, my view, Vincent, is you're dealing with people like Juncker and Barnier. They're wholly unreasonable people. Whatever sum of money which she was to offer, they would ask for double that. We did this postponement for two years. It was a bit, to me, like postponing death you can <laughs> postpone death but you won't put it off it's going to happen yeah. and uh, this the same thing with this um, exit if, we, if we're going to leave this, you can postpone it for two years five years whatever it's going to happen do you think they're trying to stop it Vincent well basically deep down she, she was a remainder yes and I think she's just showing her true colours again yeah, no, Vincent, I thank you for that. And, and, and funny enough, earlier in the week, there was a, cu- a couple of callers that came on and said, did you see her speech, Nigel, at the United Nations, where she said, we must do all we can to defend the global institutions that it's taken us so long to create. Now, she was talking there with reference to the United Nations, but I think it shows you kind of the mindset. You know, May is a very conventional career politician. There isn't an ounce of radicalism in her. And for her to be prime minister at a time when the country expects her to do something that is big and global and historic, I think must be quite a challenge to her. And not least of which, of course, because the Cabinet are all at war with each other. And if you look at various front pages today, the Sunday Times, particularly interesting, uh, just talking about the whole series of plots immediately after the general election to get rid of of Mrs May. Hi Nigel, I think the government is trying to drag this out for so long that people get fed up with the leave process and vote to stay in the EU at the next election, says Paul from Epsom. I suspect, Paul, if I'm right, I could be wrong, but if I'm right, actually, leave voters, far from getting fed up with it, will get absolutely fed up, if not furious, with our political class for doing this to us. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show. Well, the Tory party are practically at war with each other over the European question, as they have been since 1972. So it's not unusual for parties to have difficult times. And there are a lot of newspaper stories today saying Farage to lead UKIP splinter breakaway party. Apparently, if one of the candidates for the UKIP leadership, which will be announced at 5.15 this Friday at UKIP's conference in Torquay. And one of the candidates, the most controversial of them, is a woman called Anne-Marie Walters, who takes a very, very hard-line position on Islam. Um, The story is that if she becomes UKIP leader, I'm walking out immediately, and on that Monday night, I'm going to form a new breakaway splinter party, which I will lead. Can I just tell you, all those different articles that you read in the newspaper... Every single one of them is wrong. It's wrong. I won't be. I will not be forming a new breakaway splinter party. And I haven't, as far as the UKIP leadership's concerned, committed myself publicly to anybody. What I have said is if if anybody takes over the leadership of UKIP and takes it down a hard right position, then it will be finished. That's all that I've said. So please, none of you, some of you may have thought it was a wonderful idea that I do it. Others might have been horrified at the thought. Either way, it isn't going to happen. Now, talking of splits, or at least changes of position, Jeremy Corbyn had been a hardline Eurosceptic ever since he first joined the Houses of Parliament in 1983. He was part of that group of MPs with Tony Benn. He's voted against every single European treaty over the course of that time. He was, I mean, what I would call actually a hardline Eurosceptic until he became leader of the Labour Party. But he fought the general election very clearly saying that if Labour formed the government, that they'd be leaving the single market, ending free movement. Uh, he did that, but of course he has a very, very pro-EU Labour Party in the House of Commons. And despite his relative strength in the party, this is an issue on which he doesn't really feel he can carry the majority. And I understand there's some real pressure now being put on him, given that he's changed the position already for us to have a transitional period and for us to stay in the single market during it. In fact, actually, if you think about it, 
May's position and Corbyn's position, as far as our relationship with the EU is concerned for the next few years, are now pretty much identical. Not much to choose from, folks. But, and I'm going to go down to sunny Brighton, I'm going to talk to LBC's political editor, Theo Usherwood. Um, Theo, he's having a bit of pressure, more pressure, I understand, put on him by the pro-EU Labour MPs. Very much so, Nigel. Overnight, 30 MPs, 40 in total senior members uh, within the party have written to the Observer, perhaps no surprises there that they chose the Observer, asking or demanding, I should say, Jeremy Corbyn keeps Britain within the single market uh, when we leave the European Union. Now, within the last half an hour or so, Mr Corbyn's actually been responding uh, to that letter and he said that it would be very difficult for Labour to implement its policies in government if Britain stays within the single market and he particularly highlighted the issue of state aid, the ability yep. of governments to bail out failing industries like Tata Steel uh, when, when that hit the wall uh, a couple of years ago if we remain within the European Union because the rules state they're very clear because there is free movement of uh, goods, capital, services uh, uh, and people. You cannot simply, when you see one of your industries go under, step in with government money to prop that industry up. That's unfair because it would prevent that industry moving to a more competitive mm. market. So Jeremy Corbyn highlighting an issue that perhaps wasn't at the top of your agenda, perhaps wasn't at the top of the Conservative agenda, but is very much at the top of his agenda when it comes to Britain's membership for, uh, or, or, or perhaps relationship, so I should say, going So that's his fight back forward. in a sense. That's his yeah. fight back in a sense. But it would be fair to say, wouldn't it, that his, his MPs have significantly shifted the Labour Party position since the general election? Yes, it would be fair uh, to say that. But, of course, part of the issue ha has been, uh, from, Labour, from the Labour leader's point of view at least, is to keep uh, an open mind, to keep it looking slightly confusing. Because what they don't want to do is they don't want to put off those younger voters who came out uh, to vote for Jeremy Corbyn, who'd never voted in, in the past, who, but, who predominantly would support uh, a, rela a closer relationship with the European Union than others might like. And then those traditional Labour heartlands in the north of England, mm. Nigel, that went yeah. over to UKIP and then came back to Jeremy Corbyn yeah. because they liked his hard line and the fact he supported uh, the triggering and of Article 50. Three and a half to four million of them that voted for Brexit. So there is a bit of a tightrope. Theo, thank you very much for that brief. Theo Usherwood there in Brighton. So just to recap, Cap. You were asked in a general election by Jeremy Corbyn to vote for him as Prime Minister to take us out of the single market, to leave the European Union, to end the free movement of people and Theresa May said, vote for me to become Prime Minister and I will take you out of the single market, take you out of the European Union, end the free movement of people and they now both support us staying with all of those things in a transitional arrangement until at least 2021. Do you think our political leaders are trying to stop Brexit or perhaps even to betray it? I do, but tell me what you think by calling me on 0345 6060973. I'm going to ask Peter in Enfield that very question. Peter, good morning. Good morning, Lord Farage. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. So, uh, uh, are we being sold down the river by career politicians, Peter, or am I getting too panicky about this? Uh, no, you're perfectly correct. We are being stitched up in a very, very big way. I think the scene was set here after the idiot election that they've just gone through, which they didn't need to do, and having totally undermined our own position... Now she's scrambling around looking for some kind of base to put her feet on. And she's standing on shifting sand no matter what. Her own party can't get their act together. Her way of appeasing Europe is to simply shuffle into the conference room on her knees and give them what they want. Well, of course they're going to be pleased. I'm not. Um, I voted for leave. I don't think that the European uh, f uh, forum of any description is worth keeping, and neither do a very large percentage of the European captive audience. That's why they won't give the rest of the European um, prisoners a mandate for elections to say whether they want to leave, well, and that's what terrifies the EU. The one thing that Mr Juncker was very clear about after the British referendum was no more referendums. We don't want this sort of thing happening. We can't have people expressing their free will and saying they want to be independent countries. Peter, I wonder, I wonder whether a lot of people 
who were going up to Manchester next weekend for the Conservative Party conference as paid-up Conservative members, activists, leafleters, donors, local councillors. I think, Peter, a lot of those members are, gonna, are, are really going to express many of the sentiments that you just have. And I just wonder whether this attempt over the weekend to show party unity with, you know, simmering resentment, but not much more than that, I wonder whether this all boils over in Manchester next week. What do you think? I hope so, um, because we definitely need to get rid of the Tory party's tea lady, who seems to be uh, the mouthpiece for the country. God help us. Thank you, Peter from Enfield. Thank you. We'll leave it there before it gets tougher. Sue says on Facebook, Brexit didn't need to happen. If the EU had negotiated reasonably with Cameron, this is their fault. They are the bad guys, not us. They should pay the price for their pride and arrogance, not us. Well, Sue... In, in many ways, I have to say, I think that is right. I think had Cameron got some serious concessions, particularly on the question of open borders, I think he may well have been able to carry that referendum. And, you know, I say that as somebody who's always wanted us to leave, but I think his failure to get anything said to people, you know what, we're just banging ahead, again, you know, up against a brick wall with these people. And so I wonder, I wonder now whether with Mrs Merkel probably going to be re-elected today... I wonder whether she might try some sort of negotiate, some sort of backdoor negotiation in an attempt to readmit Britain on softer terms. Perhaps that sounds a bit too conspiratorial. I don't know, but anything's possible. John says, I'm in business, and I find it heartwarming to see the government are so concerned about giving us plenty of time to adjust. On budget day, we get zero time to adjust the tax changes. That's certainly true, John. John, I, I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying, but please, can I just make this point again? I think it's important that after Brexit, Global leaders were saying, this is exciting. We can now go straight to the United Kingdom and negotiate trade terms between ourselves on a bilateral basis. And they were lining up to do this. The Australians, the Indians, the Canadians, people from all over the world coming and saying, let's, you know, let's sit down. Let's start to talk about this. And what Mrs May said on Friday was, don't bother. Don't waste, you know, don't waste the airfare coming to the United Kingdom. We won't be open for global business until at least 2021. But I suspect in reality, much, much longer. And I can tell you that I spoke last night to a very senior American elected politician, a close confidant of President Trump. And let me put it like this. He was less than pleased that Britain's not open for business. They saw this as a great new opportunity that now, sadly, will not be happening for a very, very long time. Remember, folks, 85% of the world's gross domestic product is outside the European Union. You're listening to the Sunday edition of The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, and it's 10.45. We will be leaving the European Union at the end of March 2019 in name only, because we're going to stay part of a transitional arrangement, which means we'll still be part of the single market, the customs union. We will continue to have the free movement of people. We will go on paying the annual membership fee without as yet any agreement on how much Mrs May is prepared to give away as a final Brexit bill. It will look and feel exactly the same as it does as an EU member, with the one exception, we won't have any voting rights anymore. That is where we're going. I'm asking you whether you think it's a betrayal. I do think it is. I think we're heading very much in the wrong direction. I genuinely do. And I'm asked, what happened to you saying on the record that you'd return if you thought Brexit was being sabotaged? Well, I think it is being sabotaged. I won't be returning to anything just yet. Let's see where we end up with this. Let's hope there is a rebellion at the Tory conference. And people say simply this isn't good enough. I wonder what John in Weybridge thinks about Mrs May's speech, about the change of position in the Labour Party, and about the question, John, of are our big political leaders trying to stop Brexit or perhaps even betray it? Nigel, there are so many things I'd like to say to you, but uh, Mrs May's position is, uh, shall we say, very regrettable because she doesn't really believe in leaving Europe. No. Uh, she's doing her best, and people like you are going... and. Every taxi driver and every member of parliament has got a different idea on how Brexit should work. And I'm sorry to tell you, Nigel, that it ain't going to happen. Not in your lifetime. <laughs> um, and uh, all of these elderly people that voted for Brexit and all white working class men that voted for it 
they're going to suddenly realize that the elderly people are going to die off. They're going to be replaced by the younger people that want to be part of Europe. And white working class man, when he realizes that he's never going to get what he thought he was going to get, is going to turn on you. Um, and uh, I, th- I think in a, in, a, in, a, in a previous life, you would have been standing on a soapbox selling snake oil and you would have sold an awful lot. But when people got the idea, you'd been run out of town because you've got the gift of the gab. But the last thing that people need in political leaders in this world is people with uh, the gift of the gab. They need statesmen-like people with foresight. You have... I want us to, John, John, I want us to leave. I want us to pursue. I want us to pursue a global trading future as an independent, self-confident nation. But I can't do that. That you know, we won the referendum, but the ball went back to the other side of the court. It went back to the government. There's nothing, I mean, I, there, there's nothing I could have done since the referendum to change any of that. Goodness me, if I had the chance to, I certainly would. You made a terrible mistake because you see. The, the GDP of, of the UK is $65 million, uh, is, is, is $2.6 trillion. Um, the, the EU turnover, if you take ours out, is, is $8.75 trillion. We are piddling in comparison. Okay. So, 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 John, just to, just to, let, let, let me ask you a question, John. What price freedom, John? Against 440 No, no, no. What price democracy, people. John? Pardon? What price freedom? What price democracy? Well, you've got cavemen, what I call caveman politics. Ah, so, 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 so democracy people belongs people to the past, yeah? People lived in a cave and they... Yeah, yeah. Do you know something, John? You're things. just like Peter Mandelson and so many of the others who t- who've been talking over the years about the post-democratic age, that yeah. we should now be run by these terribly clever bureaucrats like Mr Juncker. The point is, John, you can argue economics backwards and forwards and people will believe things or disbelieve things. Isn't the biggest point about Brexit, that it's about democracy, it's about governing our own country and making our own laws. And you think that is 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 caveman politics? Well, the, 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 yes, because because you do. You make all the, you do. Living in a cave, you make all. Fine, the fine, John. D- d- l- let's just let, 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 let me just get this absolutely clear. Nation state democracy belongs to the caveman. Yeah. If you're living in a cave, you make all your decisions. When you when you when fine. you become a band, you, you give up. That's fine. That's fine. No, no, that's fine, John. That's fine. We, look, we are happy. We are happy to be cavemen, just like over 200 countries in the world who, through varying systems, run their own affairs. It's only, it is only in the European Union where this idea we should all surrender the ability to make our own decisions to somebody else has caught hold. Very telling, I thought, the the way that uh, John from Weybridge looks at this. Um, If the EU threw us out tomorrow... We deal with it and make ourselves successful in the world. They are delaying and betraying, says John on Twitter. Well, incidentally, I I don't bother to vote, but when Brexit was announced, my partner and I made every effort. I don't want to be hoodwinked. I suspect there are a lot of people out there who voted in that referendum. I mean, don't forget, two and a half million more people voted in the referendum that had voted in a relatively high turnout general election that had taken place the year before. A lot of those, I think, will be feeling pretty hacked off today. Simon, who's calling from Tyneside. Um, So, Simon, uh, are the Labour Party, are the Tory Party, are they trying to delay Brexit? I think they're just trying to hold positions so they can get through the the next general election, regardless of what they might say. Um, But my concern really is about the people who are going to be affected you know, in in working class areas like where I work, um, where, for example, Nissan in Sunderland, um, a high proportion of the, the kids that I teach, their parents work there and they've got aspirations to work there, and they're going to miss out. Because? Mm. Uh, because of the economic situation that's about to befall us. All right, so, well, I tell you what, Simon, I mean, if you're an expert on what's about to happen, you must be a very, very rich man. Who's to say what will happen to us or the Eurozone or America or anybody? imagine and you can think about it and you can think about it rationally and rationally 
there is going to be a massive economic impact when jobs start to disappear. And it won't be well, the what if, of, well, what if more it jobs... It won't be the likes of your friend Rhys Morgan. You know, what if more jobs are created, affected. Simon? What if we had a government that opened us up to all sorts... And don't forget, I mean, you're talking about Nissan. Don't forget, we sell more cars now that are manufactured in the United Kingdom to non-EU countries than we do to EU countries. So, Simon, there is a bigger world out there than just the European market, surely. But, but Nigel, are you not concerned about the, the exodus that people are talking about of different businesses? <laughs> I, Simon, I heard all this. If Britain doesn't join the euro, manufacturing will leave, the city will close down. I've heard all this before. It didn't happen when we sensibly chose not to join the euro. Why should it happen now? Don't no. you agree that this is like a completely different concept? Well, well, it, well it's the same. It's the same threat, Simon. It's exactly it's the we, same threat. But the, with the euro, we weren't talking about imposing tariffs and having tariffs imposed on us. Hmm. You know what I mean? This is this is a different situation. Okay, Simon. Doing. Simon, I'm going to take one last call for this hour. Thank you. The quick point about tariffs is actually currency movements up and down every month are more than the cost of tariffs in general terms. And my last caller on this subject, time running out. Kieran from Middlesbrough. Good morning. Uh, morning, Nigel. Hi. Um, I'm just. I'm 18, and I like. I wasn't old enough for the referendum, but I would like. Had I been old enough. I would have voted to leave. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm sick of everyone, you know, who was sort of older claiming, oh, we didn't know what we voted for. Or, and I feel a bit betrayed by Theresa May because I voted for her in this election. Yes. I was expecting it to be a two year process. And now it's going to be four years. Like, how much more money do we have to pour in before enough is enough? Well, 20 billion she offered for starters in Florence, but no doubt, really, that's going to be more like 40 when you add a Brexit bill on top of it. Um, Kieran, it's interesting because this idea that everybody that's young supports Remain, uh, it's just nonsense, isn't it? Oh, I know, it's ridiculous. Like, in my college class, I, I think more people were in favour of leave than actually remaining. Because no, no. I think it's every, cause most people just, like, can see past all the economic stuff, which personally I think the UK could benefit from from Brexit. But it's just, you know, national sovereignty and everything. I don't see why we shouldn't be in charge of our own laws. Well, Kieran, um, you missed out on the referendum, which probably, given your views, is a good thing. Otherwise, you'd be very upset indeed. I thank you. Now, moving on to a country where young people are voting anti-establishment, as indeed people are right across the continent. And I say that because the Germans are going to the polls today in a national election that could deliver Angela Merkel a fourth term as Chancellor. Merkel and her Christian Democrats look like getting the biggest party in the Bundestag, forming a coalition with somebody else. Uh, would you welcome Angela Merkel coming back as the German Chancellor for a fourth time? Would it be a good thing for us? If you think it'd be a great thing for Britain, call me on 0345 6060973. If you'd rather have somebody else, well, text 84850. And if you're listening in Germany, get in touch, tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC, at LBC. And as ever, you can watch us live on Facebook and comment there, and it all starts next. <laughs>